Hi, I'm Tristan. This is Magic Mayard Maple, and today we're thinking about the science behind jam. Food shots. As the COVID-19 lockdown progresses in the UK, several caterers, hotels, pubs have started to offer home delivery of a wide range of ready-to-eat foods. Now, interestingly, the BBC has recently reported that Google Trends data indicates a 750% rise in people searching for cream tea deliveries. Now, you can't have a good cream tea without lashings of strawberry jam. So today, we're going to make our own summer fruit jams and take a look at the science behind pectin gels. Whilst we might enjoy jam for its own sake, originally, Jam making was a way to preserve the fruits of spring and summer to consume all year round. When we preserve food, we are essentially trying to prevent food spoilage and thus prevent undesirable changes to the flavour, colour or texture of food. We want to stop detrimental changes in the microbial profile that would make the food unsafe to eat. And we also want to protect the nutritional value of the food. <coughs> food spoilage is a natural state of affairs. Spoilage microorganisms will often use our food as both a home and a banquet, and in metabolising their feast, they can cause the production of off flavours, odd gases, and soft or slimy textures. We must also consider that many foods will naturally harbour pathogenic microorganisms, which if left to multiply unchecked, will cause foodborne illness. Several foods, such as fruit and vegetables, remain alive following harvest, and will continue to respire and ripen. Therefore, we also have to contend with a range of intrinsic enzymes that may cause browning, changes in flavour and odour, and eventually hydrolytic enzymes that will cause softening. We must also remember that pests can not only physically damage and consume food, but they can bring new pathogens and other microbes with them. As such, food preservation relies on three basic principles. We must prevent, destroy, or at least delay the action of microbes. And once we've removed them from food, we need to prevent their reintroduction. We must also inactivate spoilage enzymes within the food. And we must also prevent or remove pests. Since time immemorial, we've relied on a handful of basic techniques to preserve foods. We can use heat to kill microorganisms and inactivate enzymes. Or we can slow down their activity by chilling and freezing foods. We can use sugar, salt, or various drying methods to decrease the availability of water, thus limiting microbial growth. We can also ferment foods to decrease their pH or increase their alcohol content, again to limit the growth of microbes. Alternatively, we can add these preservatives and others either directly to the food or through traditional processes like smoking. Over the next few episodes, we'll see some examples of all these different types of food preservation. But for now, let's get on and make some jam. The first preserve I'm going to make is my very own strawberry jam. The recipe is shown here. Straight away, you will see that we use a lot of sugar. As we will come to see, this is really important in helping the jam to set. We start by cleaning and sterilizing our jars. The jam making process will significantly lower the microbial load of the fruit but this will be for nothing if we allow bacteria, yeasts and moulds back in via dirty storage ware. I prefer to add clean, still wet jars to an oven at 160 degrees C for at least 15 minutes, but this only works if your jars have had all the traces of plastic and glue removed. Otherwise, rinse-free sterilant, as for home brewing, might be a better option. For the lids, I simply boil these in a saucepan of water. Next, we add the sugar and fruit to the saucepan bring to the boil and hold it there for five minutes. We might wish to add just a little bit of water at the very beginning, but generally there should be enough water in the fruit to solubilise the sugar. This mixture will give us a very vigorous boil, so a deep pot is preferable. By boiling this solution, we will kill off a lot of the microorganisms in the fruit and also remove some of the water. Now we must check the pH. To do this, we can take a couple of teaspoons of the mixture Stir carefully into a little water, and then check with a digital pH meter or indicator strips. We need the pH to be below 4. Most bacteria will not grow below this value, 
and a low pH will also help the jam to set. To decrease the pH, I can either use lemon juice or add just a few hundred milligrams of food grade citric acid powder. I'll then recheck the pH. When making jams with fruits that are naturally higher in citric and ascorbic acids, such as raspberries and blackberries, I find this adjustment is rarely required. Next, we add some water to the pectin to make a fine paste. We then add some of the boiling jam, mix, and add the whole lot back into the pan. If we directly add pectin to the pan, this may cause the mixture to boil over, plus we'll get lots of little blobs of pectin. Pectin is a natural gelling agent found in plant cell walls and typically extracted from apple pomace and citrus peel. Pectins are a complicated family of polysaccharides, predominantly made of long chains of alpha-1,4 linked D-galactuuronic acid. The rhamnose can also enter this chain sometimes, and some other sugar monomers, such as xylose, can be attached in side chains. In the food industry, we mainly classify pectins on their degree of esterification. Traditional high sugar jams make use of high methoxyl pectins, i.e. pectins in which more than 50% of the carboxylic acid groups on the galactuuronic acid chain are esterified to a methyl group. This influences the way they form gels. Now, this is the main job of pectin in jam, to form a gel. Gels use a small amount of physical material to hold on to a large amount of water. In the model here, we can see that individual chains of polymer are cross-linked in certain places, making a three-dimensional network. Water is captured within these pockets, so in terms of texture, gels behave somewhere between liquids and solids. As we boil our fruit, pectin will be extracted from the cell walls and solubilized. Our remaining carboxylic acid groups will dissociate, giving each chain a strong negative charge. This is problematic as these chains will repel each other. We need our chains to get close enough to form crosslinks. Hence, the gelation of high methoxyl pectins relies on two factors. Firstly, as we boil away some of the water and decrease the water activity of the mixture by adding sugar, we can physically force the pectin strands in closer proximity. Second, as we lower the pH closer to between 3 and 3.5, far fewer of the carboxylic acid groups will be dissociated. Therefore, there is less electrostatic repulsion between chains, and these can cross-link using a mixture of hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic interaction. Next, we need to double-check the soluble solids content of the jam. According to the compositional regulations, we need to reach a minimum dry solids content of 60% to qualify as jam, though in this case, I will aim for a content of 66%. These regulations state that we should check the solids content using a refractometer, like this. This device operates on the principle that as light passes through a transparent liquid, like water, it slows down, creating a bending effect. The more material dissolved in the water, the more the light is bent. To use the refractometer, we place a few drops of jam on the prism and close the screen to remove any air bubbles. We can then hold this up to the light and read off the solids content of the jam. We can add water or boil the jam for longer to adjust the solids content as required. Once we have the correct solids content, we must check the jam for set. Here we spoon a droplet of jam onto a cold plate. I put mine in the fridge earlier. As the jam cools down, it should form crinkles if it's moved. This tells us that the jam is ready and will set properly on cooling. With our testing done, we will leave the jam to cool a little to 80 degrees C and then using a wide neck funnel, we will fill our jam jars. We need to fill the jar to within five millimeters of the top, then dry our freshly sterilized caps and seal. After a few hours at room temperature, the jam will set. And if we are using tamper seal lids, these can be depressed without them popping back up. Once we have this basic approach sorted, we can make a wide variety of other fruit jams. We can also branch into jellies, which are made from fruit juice or an aqueous extract from a plant. Here I've made a mint jelly by boiling mint and apples together, then straining the mixture before boiling again with an equal weight of sugar. 
Because the apples are a good source of pectin, I can add less of the pectin powder to this recipe. We can also branch into fruit curds. These are not pectin gels, but rather a thick, creamy emulsion of water and fat, stabilized by egg protein. Here, the sugar slows down the rate at which the egg protein strands denature, so that they can be gently unfolded, and only then be denatured by a combination of lemon juice and a low heat. This is also why we prepare lemon curd in a bowl on top of a saucepan of water, and never in the saucepan itself. We will go into more detail about emulsions in a future episode. So, our end result is a cupboard bursting with delicious jams, jellies, marmalades and fruit curds, giving us a taste of summer all year round. Given the lovely weather, we're going to treat ourselves to a full afternoon tea, with egg and cress sandwiches, some loose leaf Darjeeling, and of course, some Cornish style cream scones. See you all next time. <laughs>